welcome. This is our first virtual, it's an experiment, right? It's like experimental poetry. You try and then you try again and then you try again. But this is our first virtual Zoom Buffalo Corner reading get together. And we had planned or we had thought it would be our last of the season. We started in September and we went through the academic year. But now if people want to, we can consider maybe adding a few in during summer, but that's a different story. Um, so I feel tonight we are in a sense improvising, uh, trailblazing and hoping. And we have two featured readers who are among the best that I know. Uh, Rabbi Alex Lazarus Klein and Cantor Barbara J. Ostfeld. So I think uh, maybe, Perry, you want to take over and introduce our, our first featured reader? Sure. Are we uh, assuming that there's no one that wants to read a poem or open with a poem? I haven't heard anybody say so. So why don't you open sure. with the poem? Sure. To sit well, first of all, I want to thank Gunilla because she's done a lot of work getting all of this together. And Daniel. Daniel, I, I realize there's a lot going on with the posting. And Joanne, of course. Joanne really has worked really hard. And um, thank you to the rabbi and Cantor for presenting tonight. Gunilla asked me to start with a poem, and so you know me, I can't, I can't resist. Uh, but I chose one of someone else's I thought was appropriate, and then we can get into Rabbi's reading. Uh, I chose a William Stafford poem tonight. Uh, William Stafford writing in the probably 1990s, and uh, always one of my favorites. And Stafford used to say, try to listen to poetry in neutral. And I always remembered that because you just have to let it happen to you. And I really think that this is the time people when we need poetry the most. And so I've been reading quite, quite a bit of it. Uh, so this Stafford poem is really about the gift that poetry brings to us and, and the gift of living in the moment. And I think it's a great message. It's called, You Reading This, Be Ready. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into the evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now? Starting here, right here in this room, when you turn around. That's William Stafford. Yay! <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to clap, but it's a, it's a, a beautiful thought, I think. Uh, Rabbi Alex, I have, I am honored to, to introduce uh, Rabbi Lazarus, Lazarus Klein. And as you know, he's a spiritual leader of the congregation, Shir Shalom. Also, if you don't know, he has a degree in creative writing from Columbia University, which is pretty impressive. And he has been writing himself for about two decades. He is in the midst, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about this, of publishing his first book uh, entitled, Where I Find God. Here's a couple things that I admire about his poetry, what, what, what I have heard, the tone, the imagery, and the positive message that he always conveys. So please help me welcome Rabbi Alex. Rabbi, all yours. It's such a pleasure. Thank you, Perry. Your writing is outstanding and I'm just in awe and really uh, thanks to Ganilla and to Dan and Cantor Osfeld. It's really an honor. Uh, I can't say any more. Uh, thank you for providing 
an opportunity, not just for myself, but for other poets to have a voice. Uh, poetry is um, sometimes hard to break into and really, really appreciate uh, having different champions. Um, I write from my heart and uh, I try to uh, really think when things come to me and I've been writing for quite a while since my childhood, uh, the poetry collection that Gary is helping me with uh, go back um, over 20 years to my college days uh, and through becoming a parent and a rabbi. And actually I have my daughter in the back of the room. I'm not gonna show her, but so she can listen in as well. Um, so I prepared uh, about 10 poems. We'll see, they're not, nothing very long. Um, and uh, these are all from the book and they're on the theme of the book, which is where I found God. And it comes from the very first poem that I seriously ever wrote, which was in a class on Abraham Joshua Heschel. We had an opportunity to pretend like we were Abraham Joshua Heschel and write a poem. And this poem just came to me and uh, it just really resonated back then. And its title was Where I Found God. So I'm gonna start with that and then I'll tell you where the poem come from in my life. Uh, there are different styles and different places, but they're all about searching. So I hope you enjoy and uh, really appreciate your presence in this uh, difficult time. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, okay, so this was written from Columbia University. Where I Found God. On Wednesday, I watched the stars and the moon go down my back. Venus was a cold blue and revolving retrograde. Saturn, a huge saucer I could eat off of. It was in astronomy my freshman year, and I looked up at the sky on the top of the old gray building pupin where our telescopes sat, and I saw a million stars, like rocks in the water, gleaming, sparkling. I imagined a million different worlds with creatures of all shapes and sizes, and I thought of God, that is when I still believed. Could the universe stand on its own? It's the question the ancients always asked, and we rarely ask anymore, but then it seemed real. Or maybe it was at Camp Galil, where alone, celebrating Shabbat and watching all the other counselors drive away, I danced around in the dark grass under the shadow of trees, and I saw stars like nightlights guiding me somewhere. The air was clean and crisp, and I had space. The buildings of the city of humanity had left me and been replaced by space and trees. My lungs expanded and I thought I was part of everything. A tiny energy ball whipped like a ball in a pinball machine through life. I was uncontrolled and uncontained where, when Harry invited me into a cabin to get away from the dark loneliness that was. And that was April 1996. Uh, the next poem is about an early moment in my life. Um, I, uh, when I was eight or nine years old, I was at Camp Ramon in the Poconos. It's a conservative camp. And uh, uh, in the middle of the night, they, uh, there was a new night of shooting stars and they took us out to look at them. Uh, and it was the most amazing thing. Uh, and uh, you'll see, I'm dictating this. So this is a remembrance of my eight or nine year old self. The Night of Shooting Stars. The Night of Shooting Stars begins at 4 a.m. with counselors waking us from fitful sleep, groggy and perspiring under wool blankets and fears of midnight raids. We dress quickly, the smell of old socks and a room of stale breath, huddled together and brought into a field leading into the mysterious forest we have never been before. Look up, they tell us. And for miles, all we can see are blinking lights. They are beautiful and different. I want desperately to see one fall. We trail off under the cover of trees, flashlights elongating our shadows and creating weird shapes, my legs fragile and growing. Every few minutes, another child screams at a flicker he or she has seen from above. I try to find the section of the sky they are pointing but I'm always a second late. I wonder if these shapes exist at all or are merely phantoms conjured up by the night. 
Our guide stops us and excitedly tells us of a tree shaped just like a camel, its black shadow holding humps. I feel we are taking part in something secretive. Slowly, the light of the new morning begins to spread out over the horizon. We are losing the night, and I still have yet to see a shooting star. We walk tired into the center of camp, watching the sun glide smoothly over a lake I am still not old enough to swim across. And then someone points to a shape barreling down toward us. The last of the shooting stars has made its way past the blackness of the sky. It is right above us, a trail of ice and snow, unbelievable heat crashing hard like a rocket. Should we be running for cover? No one is panicked, our counselors watching along beside us. And really, for the first time I can remember, I feel I have actually seen a piece of God. Thank you. I'm going to fast forward somewhat uh, to a trip uh, that I took to Israel more recently uh, with a group of Presbyterians, maybe even some people on the call are here. And uh, I was sitting in Mount Beatitudes. Uh, and while everyone was looking at the church and looking at the mountain and Tiberias, Lake Tiberias, uh, the Sea of Galilee, um, I was able to write a poem next to someone who I didn't know. And I just love that experience. So it's called To My Dear Friend. I sat on a stone by another stone, a lake before us, and the sun low on the horizon, and the weather, the perfect mixture of cool and warm. We had much to share, the two of us filled with our own thoughts. We knew not one another, so we sat in silence. Others prayed around us the words of a sermon in, an, in the air. We could be anyone from any time, and for what seemed like an eternity, we hardly moved, our breath slow and deliberate, almost in sync. I knew not even the face of my partner, and when we rose and went our separate ways, I did not look which direction my friend had turned, only God to bear witness that we had ever met at all. Um, so this is another poem. I think it's from the same trip or a trip right afterwards where we uh, were meeting uh, with a, a Jewish Muslim couple, beautiful couple that uh, started a school, a preschool for their kids because there was no place for Jews and Muslims to have their kids together. Uh, and uh, we got to go to their apartment and hear their story. Uh, and uh, this is about that journey. It was our last day in Israel. It was with a clergy trip, an interfaith clergy trip. It's called Ehab ben Ora, and that was, those were their names. Our driver's name is Nisim, Hebrew for miracle. The plastic lights on the roof of the bus look like they have wings. They are angels, and we are flying. To our right, a pool of water they call the Mediterranean. It is also called Yam Ha'akaron the sea behind us. The palm trees lean towards us, the wind making them look modest, their fronds wrapped together like a woman in prayer. We are on our way to Jaffa, where for thousands of years pilgrims emerged from the sea, the holy land a mirage in the distance. And now in our new friend's apartment, they are dressed in white as they discuss love. It is full of life and laughter, the candles on the small table dance with light. He is Muslim, she is Jewish, tea is brewing in the kitchen. Our bare feet rest on carpets of gold. Yes, God could be here. Smoke drifts from our ceramic cups. A rooster walks in the courtyard beside a peacock. Sunlight drifts in, resting on a tray of oranges. A picture by my right is in Arabic letters, resembling a benign snake. I asked the woman what it means. It is God's name, Allah. Uh, the next poem happened after uh, there was a terrible shooting in New Zealand a couple of years ago. And um, I got to go to the mosque on Haim Road. And I was very touched by a 15 year old who shared her tale about what it meant to her uh, it was a very beautiful story, and so I wrote this poem 
um, about, uh, about her life. It's called After the Shooting in New Zealand. We are so far away from one another. In this pulsing body, we can only reach so far. Our internal thoughts form a circular wall over which our eyes strain to see. I want to love you, but I am constrained. What do you even look like? I listen to the girl describing the shooting. It is across the ocean, and yet in pictures, the mosque where it happened was her own. And now her parents worry about leaving her alone. In books, we could learn about human interactions that occurred lifetimes ago. And yet here on earth, the steps of my house feel too steep, and there are only three of them. They say the air we breathe is the same as it has always been. Our molecules part of the fabric of the universe. We are so far away from one another, too far to realize we are all the same. It's funny how emotional these can be. Um, this poem uh, Rabbi, uh, was can written. I just say yes. one thing. What, sure, sure. What, what we are, I mean, I've done readings in public for 30 years, 40 years, maybe even 50 years. But what you hear in the crowd is this like, <sighs> or, you know, some kind of response that you don't hear now, but we are all feeling it. So please go on. Thank you, Ganella, and uh, really thanks again. This, this poem, uh, when I finished rabbinical school, I had a lot of frequent flyer miles from a trip I used to make to Atlanta. And I decided I had some friends in Thailand, uh, sorry, Taiwan. And so I flew out there and uh, it was very cheap to get to Taiwan. And believe it or not, back there, that was the first time I ever saw people with masks. They knew SARS had just come there a couple of years before. Uh, and so I went to Thailand, Thailand uh, to Bangkok, and it was my first time really traveling by myself like that. It was very meaningful, um, and I would meet strangers along the way. Uh, in Thailand, in Bangkok, you, if you've been there, you know there are very big um, Buddhas um, that are as big as a building. And uh, so this was written uh, with a, someone I, I don't know, even know the person's name that became my friend for a short time there. Uh, it's called Freedom. By the big Buddha in Bangkok, we set the birds free. I did it because I felt sorry for them, not for the luck. One small bird would not fly. He sat in the dry, brittle grass, fidgeting. You went to see what was wrong. I was skeptical. I thought the birds were trained to go back to the old woman who sold us the cage. For you, it didn't matter. Life was upon us, and you had to take joy in it. Your smile as big as Buddha's gold. Later on the bus over to Siam Reap, with the driver honking at peasants, I thought of the birds and was happy we set them free, for even if they had just returned to the cage, even if a few small birds would never fly away at all. Uh, this one is also, that trip is describing, I went from Thailand and from Bangkok, I could go to Cambodia. Uh, that's all the time I had. And I went to Angkor Wat. And uh, this is about the very poor young ladies. They were teenagers. Uh, they learned English through begging. Uh, and it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. When this clears up, go to it. It's, it's just amazing. All these old... Um, uh, wonderful uh, places of prayer temples and uh, they're just really remarkable. It's called Mr. Do Not Forget to Buy My Coffee. I wait for the sunrise at the lake by Anchor Wat. A crowd of Cambodian girls surround me. Mr. Buy a postcard. Mr. Buy a t-shirt. The lake is grass filled and lovely. Shiny as marble. It is light outside but the sun has yet to make an entrance. I talk with the girl with a blue button down shirt and shorts with, from a Mexican beer. My name is Lisa. My Cambodian name is Kaira. It means flower, like sunflower. She tells me of her family, brothers and sisters, teaching me words in Cambodian. Suez Dai, hi. Somain La, good luck. Tanria, sunrise. Saat, beautiful. I asked what she wants to be when she grows up. A teacher, she says. 
There are thick gray clouds overhead. It does not look promising. No sunrise to you today, you know lucky. It's time to survey the monuments. As I leave, the girls return to salesmen and I to tourists. Mr. Buy a postcard, Mr. Buy a t-shirt. Deakun, deakun. No thank you, no thank you. Um, so I just have uh, two other ones I wanted to read. Uh, this one, Ganilla, really helped me with. Um, it is dedicated to a friend of mine who feels a lot of uh, sadness. And I wanted to um, be able to let that sadness go. Uh, so, but Ganilla really was very helpful with this and uh, she saw promise in the poem. And I really, she was the first person uh, other than that other person uh, who was dedicated to that I shared it with. It's called, The Very Thing That Makes Us Fly. Mm. There is so much sadness, oceans of it, whole planets. If we are not watchful, it can seep into our every moment and round them like a tear. If you haven't already watched for it on the faces of those you love, even the happiest among us, listen to it in song and story. It is the, it is the very air we breathe. You ask for me to cry with you and not stand up and walk away. So much of it seeps into me, like oceans, planets, like your soul itself. Hoping that the deep, dark, black hole that you say sits in your dreams will lift off of your heart, flying like a shadow and disappear into the darkness of the room in which we sit. Sadness is just that. Feel it even in this poem, the very thing that makes us fly. Uh, I have one more that I've been writing a little poetry. I, I know uh, poets among us or artists. Uh, this is a good time, pandemics, for finding uh, finding different moments of uh, joy in there. I've never read this one. I don't even know if I've shared this with anyone. <laughs> uh, so it's still a work in progress, but I wanted to bring it for this moment uh, to, to close. It's called uh, Heart Twangs. Sorry. I even can't read my handwriting. Heart pangs, it's called. <laughs> my daughter laughed at me. Um, whoever you are, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, find the slight pang in your faraway heart, the bend in your elbow, the crease in the fabric of your clothing. Resist the urge to straighten them, to turn away from what you are feeling. For it is there, and only there, that authenticity and truth reside. Train yourself to notice these emotions. Seek them out. Encourage others to do the same. Suddenly the world will change for you. The heavy shadow that accompanies us on the sunniest days will now feel airy. You will feel airy. Moments will now cling to one another, like a child's hand upon a parent's sleeve. We need not fear what is absent, for these slight twinges are also present, just as light is always there, even when our eyes and ears are fully closed, even when we have lost track of where we are in the vast world that we call home. So thank you, blessings to you, appreciate your time. I'm gonna turn off the mic and uh, listen to my colleagues and friends uh, with their own poetry. Good night, Lila Tov. Thank you so much, Rabbi Alex, uh, before you go. That was great. I don't know if you can hear, am I unmuted? Yes, Rabbi, really, really great. And what I really noticed this time was the ending. The endings are so good, <clears throat> so beautiful thing. Rab, I can't hear hear, hear you because oh, you muted yourself. I got you. I'll tell I hear you. When, when I mute myself, I hear you. Don't worry. I can oh, hear you. It's okay. wonderful. Never Thank mind. you for saying that. Okay. <laughs> All right. so, Good. So, yeah, before we move on to our next featured reader, is there anybody who would like to share a poem? We usually have somebody. Karen, you want to share a poem? I would love to. All right, make it short, short and sweet. Absolutely. Love in a time of Corona, after love in a time of cholera. I see Italian lips move, singing the national anthem 
atop their balconies, while the scala is shuttered. In the Duomo, you can hear a pin drop, and dolphins swim through St. Mark's Square. In this week's Torah portion, Kitisa, we wait at the foot of Mount Sinai for a word from Moses. None comes. Angst washes over us. When will he return with the tablet? Panic becomes a golden cap, a visual reminder that we must have something to believe in. Slaves to uncertainty, we now wonder, does the dashboard flaunt a droplet of virus, this doorknob, this surfboard. Our people fashion a toilet paper god from an iceberg of rolls. Exodus 30, 21, you shall wash your hands and you shall not die. Comforting, make it 20 seconds, rubbing, cupping with soapy water. The French must stop kissing, but I will not stop kissing you nor keep a distance in kilometers, nor don a cardboard donut. For I have an animal hunger for my neighbors and pure lust for you, a love that spells I am here. Well, thank you. Wow. That was great. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful energy. Yes. We cannot let it beat us. Did anybody else bring a poem they wanted? Can to you hear me? Andre, we can hear you. Five minutes. No, no, no. I'm not going to read a poem. Uh, I would just like to comment on the rabbi's poetry. Uh, Please. If I didn't know him, I would say that his poetry uh, has a terrific imagery and terrific color. But I would notice what I would notice most would be that this poetry was written by a very nice person, by a very good person. And now, I don't know if that's influenced by the fact that I know him, but I would think that even if I didn't know him, that's what I would get out of this, the, the poetry, that whoever wrote this poetry was a good, good person. Is it? Thank you, Andre. So, Andre, I miss you. So sweet of you. And hopefully we'll be together soon and uh, see your beautiful poetry as well. This was not directed at you. It was just a comment. You, I didn't know you were still there. <laughs> and and I want you all to know that Andre Toth is one of our featured writers in the fall. So uh, he has a lot to tell us about the bomb. No, if I'm still alive, if I'm not, then Marilyn will call and cancel. <laughs> You'll be here. I sure hope so. Anybody else wanted to share something before we go on to our, we have a fabulous uh, second featured reader, Cantor Barbara J. Ostfeld. And First, I just wanted to connect to one of the things that Rabbi Alex uh, read. Uh, one of the lines was, yes, God could be here. And in a sense, I feel like we all work so hard. I hate these Zoom things. Uh, I, they exhaust me. But yes, God could be here. So maybe it's all a good thing we are doing. Now, to introduce Barbara, I want to read her official uh, author profile and then add a sentence or two because we have known each other, and not we don't know each other, but we have met and known each other in the community for 25 years. So, anyways, uh, here's Barbara J. Ostfield. She didn't become obsessed by singing until she was two. Though she didn't learn to ride a bike until she was 12 and never did learn to climb to the top of the rope in gym, at 17, she innocently cracked through a stained glass ceiling and was admitted 
to Hebrew Union College's School of Sacred Music. At age 22, she became the first woman ordained as a cantor in 3,000 years of Jewish history. But foolishly, she turned down an invitation to appear in What's My Line? Nevertheless, she persisted and served more than 27 years as cantor of congregations in Clifton, New Jersey, and in Great Neck, Rochester, and in Buffalo, New York. And then for 10 years as the placement director of the American Conference of Cantors. Barbara lives in Buffalo, New York with her husband. I think most of us know him. Uh, her essays have appeared in Lilith, magazine, New Jewish Feminism, 10 Minutes of Torah, and elsewhere. Her memoir, Cat Bird, write it down. You all want to read this book. Cat Bird, The Ballad of Barbie Prim, was published last spring by Irva Press. And let me tell you, I read Cat Bird in two days flat. Two of the most difficult things for any author to control is tone and tempo. But here we have a master musician showing us how to do it. So I'm very proud and happy to welcome Cantor Barbara to our Buffalo Corner Reading Series. Because when I arrived to Buffalo with my husband Daniel and two very young daughters some 25 years ago, it was Cantor Barbara's voice and those musical choices that she made that enticed me to return to temple again and again. So thank you because you opened a door, the door, and here we are. Uh, so, yep, yeah, um, I wanted before we start, since we have a little extra time, now I read through Cantor Barbara's memoir very quickly and enjoyed it. Uh, it was quite a trip. And what I brought from it most of all was this feeling that being a woman is so different from being a man. And so I wrote this poem uh, for Cantor Barbara. It's dedicated to her. And since we have a little time, do you mind if I share it? It's okay? It's called Coming Home. For Cantor Barbara Ostfeld. Wind soaked and salt rubbed. I open my door with two hands, left for yesterday and right for tomorrow. Let my stormy self loose, pulling in two directions, with only a pen as a rudder, sail, and figurehead. Anchor lost somewhere among the tents by the gates of Troy. Seeing I am no crafty Odysseus, my bed might have shifted during unexpected turbulence, knowing well that I, although hardened like a drop of amber in need of polishing to bring that warm honey out, I am no Odysseus arriving home after the long Trojan War. My battles were fought differently. No word rooted or uprooted can fix that pain. I met him once, the great Odysseus, in a harbor far away and asked the tricky old hero my question. If the ark is buried in the garden, how do I find the way? He lifted my shirt, drew a map between my breasts, and on the smooth skin 
of my belly, which he kissed twice, muttering something in old Greek about a tree, the juicy pomegranate with bitter crunchy black pits, getting stuck in his aging teeth, making his gums bleed, his breath stink. So I left him alone on the beach with no paradise in sight. Please welcome Barbara Ostwell. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm looking out at a screen that's full, filled with um, faces I know to a greater or lesser degree. Some of you I, I don't know, but very few. And the rest of you I count, I'm privileged to count as friends. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a high school friend um, on my screen, which is just incredibly cool and wonderful. And um, a colleague who read a stunning poem, uh, Cantor Karen Weber. And um, many people with whom I'm very close and you, you know who you are. Camilla, that poem was beautiful and I, I, uh, I hope to be worthy of it, um, of, its, uh, of its lyricism. Um, so I, I'd like to start out just by saying that of Rabbi Lazarus Klein, it, it, when he began reading his poems, the first two mentioned his uh, camp experiences as a child. So unbeknownst to him, uh, the excerpt I'm going to read from my book is also about a camp experience. And um, so we clearly we worked very hard developing the theme of tonight's reading and we've interwoven it, you know, with great diligence and care. Just kidding. Okay. So here, here is the reading and it is not a poem. It's, it's just a little vignette from my book. Catbird, The Ballad of Barbie Prim. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> For camp, mom bought me two new pairs of shorts and matching tops. The outfits are the same, but in different colors. One top is orange with swimming turtles on it, and the other one is green with swimming turtles on it. Dad says that their scientific name is Chelonia Midas. The shorts are from Sears. Now mom wants me to learn how to iron them. The iron is heavy plus noisy and I get to practice on dad's handkerchiefs. Mom says not to iron the folds, even though I want to, I want to make a perfect flat square. But she says that ironing the folds will weaken the fabric in the folded parts. When we get on the bus to go to camp, the kids start singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer. Take one down and pass it around. 98 bottles of beer on the wall. I hate that song right away because the words are stupid and the melody is stupid. When we get close to camp, the kids start singing again. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. And I hate that song even more because it doesn't make any sense. So far, the songs are making me start to worry about camp. The other girls in my cabin all choose bottom bunks. I am glad and take a top bunk. Then I climb up and it hurts my feet. So I feel even more worried about this whole thing. Mary Lynn, our counselor, tells us that we have to write a postcard home and I feel better and start to write but the other girls are complaining. We are told that we have two minutes to write, so I make it short, even though I have so much to say. Dear parents, I write in my best cursive, we made it. We have a new cabin. It's neat. I love everything, Barbie. Quickly, I address it. That night after lights out, the counselor has us tell our names and a little bit about ourselves. I wait till last because I don't know what to say. All the girls tell where they go to church, 
So I say that I'm Jewish and where I go to temple. And I say that I don't have a best friend and that I like to read and sing. Someone snorts and then others do too. It's not a nice sound and I'm embarrassed. Mary Lynn says, now stop it girls, that's not nice. But she doesn't sound mad. I bet she rolls her eyes. I want to go home. In the morning, the girls get dressed. I don't have to get dressed because I slept in my clothes. I don't want to get undressed in front of them. As Candy and Ellen leave for the bathhouse, one of them says, I know which one's the Jew. I have to urinate, but I don't want to go with them. I wait. After they all leave, I start for the door and realize that I'm going to wet my pants. And I do, and I just cry. I stuff the wet orange shorts in my trunk and put on the green ones. I head for the mess hall and get a bit lost. I miss breakfast and have to find a counselor to tell me where to go. I like making lanyards and I like rest time. I spend every rest time writing long letters home. Mom didn't let me bring books because I'm supposed to do what the other girls do and make friends. We go on a long hike. It's very hot and I'm sweating. I have no one to walk with. One boy sprains his ankle and gets to ride on the truck. I ask if I can ride too, but they say no. I cry a little and one girl points at me. I hate camp and there are black flies. I have five bites on my legs and two on my arm and I think there are some on my back too. The lake is very cold and we have to tread water to pass our test. I don't care about the test. test. It's not like it's school. They make me try every day. They call out, you can do it, but I can't and I don't care. I just want to get out of the water. All of the girls in my bunk passed the test in the first few days. Just the little kids are in the water with me now. Today, Mary Lynn says, Barbie, why don't you take a quick shower today? Won't that feel nice? Then you can change your clothes too. No, thank you. You really should, you know, hygiene is important, particularly for growing girls. Well, Mary Lynn, I haven't started to menstruate yet, so it's really okay. Mary Lynn sort of waves her hands and says, okay, okay, backs away. I knew before that YMCA stood for Young Men's Christian Association. And it's obvious from the songs we sing around the campfire that it's a Christian camp. All of the kids are Christian, I'm used to that. There are only a few Jews in my whole school, but none here at camp. So I'm wondering why my parents sent me to this camp. They make fun of me here worse than at school. I am a Jew. I am not going to the showers in a camp. So um, why did I choose this particular vignette? Am I going on too long? Oh no, you have plenty of time. We have a whole hour actually. <laughs> Why am I reading this particular vignette to you in Buffalo on the 21st of May in 2020? Well, when I was 10 years old and headed to camp, I was anxious about the completely different life I would be leave it, leading for two weeks. The bus ride exacerbated my anxiety because the bus singing sounded ominous to me. I had no control over two weeks of my life, which seemed like a long time back then. No accustomed reading, no secret snacking, no creature comforts like a soft bed or finding shade in the heat or staying out of the freezing lake or even feeling safe. So given the exigencies of this pandemic, I've been reminded daily of new and ongoing dislocation. And I picked a vignette that highlighted the dislocation of so many changes all at once. And um, 
I'm certain that I'm not alone looking at the sea of faces on my screen um, in feeling dislocated in that particular way. So I'm wondering if there are any uh, questions and I, I just would like to pose a question and myself and ask if there was a time in any of your lives when you felt completely out of control of your environment. Um, perhaps I hear a clanging sound. Oh, it's my big Ben. The, the grand oh, it's, your... it's, it's telling us it's eight o'clock, a little <sighs> early. Okay. Um, maybe there was a hospitalization that you went through, or maybe you were stranded in an airport, or you encountered a natural disaster, or snowmageddon, you live in Buffalo, or a hurricane, for those of you who live in Florida, a flood. And I'm wondering, um, did you, how did you find a way to cope? Any responses? <laughs> I see hands, I see hands, but I, Gadilla, shall I call on people? Yeah, I'm Andre Tove. I, I can answer that, if you want me to do that. By all means. Uh, when I was uh, a kid, I was about six years old, and I lived on Milan, Italy. And uh, I was playing on the sidewalk while my mother was looking down at me. And uh, a column of uh, German uh, tanks and trucks was going by, it started going by, and, uh, and so my mother said to me to raise my hand and uh, salute, otherwise, you know, bad things would happen to me. And so I did, and uh, while they were going by, they, uh, there was a motorcycle with a sidecar, and these two Germans came out of the, the motorcycle, one of them came to me and put, put his head, hand on my head and said uh, in broken Italian, good boy or something. And at the same time, they didn't get out of the, car, the, the sidecar because of me. They got out of it because there was a man across the street who was walking and didn't stop to salute. So they, they went across and beat the hell out of him. And, uh, and I didn't know what to do. And uh, my mother was terrorized and so was I. And I think that it was the first time in my life, and I was very young, uh, I, I was younger than I am now. Uh, that was a long time ago. That I really felt out of control and frightened from, for my own life. And uh, things have gotten better since. And uh, you know, I'm still here. And uh, the Germans don't scare me anymore. And there are very, very few uh, Panzer going by Hunter's Lane in Williamsville. that we haven't seen them in weeks. And, uh, and uh, so that's it. Uh, Andre, that that was incredibly moving. I'm sure that everyone <laughs> agrees with me that hearing stories like that is uh, is life changing. So thank you for that. I I did see some other hands that were raised. I think Connie. Yeah. Connie, I saw your hand. Yeah. Um, as Barbara is aware, um, for the past year I've been undergoing chemotherapy. And so I've had a little bit of practice in terms of um, extra hygiene and um, my own form of social distancing and um, being very careful. And my pandemic uh, dilemma has been missing the communal prayer and the, the gathering. I, I miss my Kabbalah Shabbat. And as much as I being retired from IT, enjoy the Zoom. Um, I can't wait to um, be able to meet up again on Fridays and Saturday mornings. Um, so, 
you know, I, I love the technology and technology has been very good to me in terms of career, but um, I can't wait um, for the damn vaccine to uh, come through. Yeah, I think we're all nodding, and um, but uh, your situation is is more dramatic. Well, I've had a little more practice than most. Yes, you have for a very long time, and I have hair, as you can see. But listen, that's great. Um, I remember when your hair was a little longer than that. Uh, but in any event, I, I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like to be in that situation and to long for the, the human. Uh, contact and the camaraderie that really can only be generated uh, in a group, which is why we congregate. <laughs> um, I, I, oh, Karen. Cantor Karen Weber. Thank you. Um, dislocating. Having a son with autism, beginning my career as a cantor, and then discovering couple of years in that I have this child who it's like he's from another planet and this was 27 years ago so there wasn't as much known then as there is now and it took everything I had it's something I didn't understand at all it was uncharted territory it was uncomfortable it was all of those things and yet I adored this little person so I had to figure out how to communicate with him, how to invite him into our world. And it, it took all of me to do that. And so a lot of things in my career were pushed to the sides at that point. So that's, yeah, that would be my dislocating the most. And then my, my daughter, years later, also has special needs. So, um, yeah, I don't really know a typical relationship with children, but I know an interesting one. Well, and those experiences um, have given voice to um, your unique style, Karen, and, and your, your, all of your means of expression. Um, I did see some handkerchiefs. I also, so I know these stories are resonating. Um, are there other uh, comments people want to make? I think that there, there's something to be said about recognizing, um, as, as Rabbi Lazarus Klein said, the things for which we have to be grateful and being in the moment um, is one of them. And I, I would imagine that people have comments about the things for which they're particularly grateful um, as this quarantine has us kind of locked in the moment and uh, there are things, um, there are things for which we are grateful uh, in ways we might not have realized uh, before this lockdown. Anybody have anything to um, to reflect about in terms of gratitude during this crazy time, Adrian? Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I would say, you know that. What, what has um, occurred to me over this period when we're isolated is that I have a better sense of time mm -hmm. because I was always rushing around from one thing to another. And now there's not much to rush around for. So I just, sometimes I just sit and do nothing and it feels wonderful. <laughs> um, I, in the beginning though, that really upset me and I, I hate doing, I hated doing nothing. I, I always feel like I'm wasting time. I'm unproductive. And then I decided, no, sometimes it's important to just sit and think and experience what's around you. Um, I sit in my backyard a lot and watch the rabbits. <laughs> and uh, it just clears your mind. Um, the other thing too is I've enjoyed calling people. I've been calling people in my temple, calling people for different organizations, just to chat because everybody is lonely right now. And, uh, and that's made me um, feel better also. It has a benefit for me as well as them. Um, so there's a lot of positive things coming out of this. 
And I try to remind people about that, you know, that uh, you, if you're in a safe place, uh, if you're not sick, if you have food and medicine, things aren't so terrible, you know, and, and there's other ways to satisfy that lonely feeling. Um, you know, even though, you know, we wish it was over and I do, <laughs> uh, it's still, it's still good to appreciate what you have. Thank you for that. Bruce? Yeah, I, I, a couple of things that I think we're, we're grateful for. Um, Rabbi Alex and I were talking about this one thing. One um, second, Bruce. Yeah. <clears throat> There's something amiss with your microphone. So if you can adjust it just a touch, I don't know uh, how exactly to tell you to do that, but you're, you're feeding back a little bit and we can't understand what you're saying. Let me see, hang on a second. That's better. All right, I think there might've been some background noise somewhere else, I don't know. Anyway, uh, but Rabbi Alex and I were talking about this and the, the attendance on live stream of our Friday night services is much larger than our physical attendance was on Friday night services in the sanctuary. And I think there's, a, there's more of a need for people to connect with their temple and with their spirituality and with their religion. And I think people are looking for that. And they're, like I said, more, more are taking advantage of some of the online offerings than the in-person offerings. And I think that hopefully when, it, when we can return, to the in-person gatherings, it will translate to that, that they'll say, you know what, this is something that right now it's important to them. And hopefully it will, it will continue to be. The other thing is that when you do things like this, and if this was done in the sanctuary, obviously as you were reading, you'd hear the applause and the laughter and stuff like that. But the person up on the, at the lectern can see everyone's faces, the people sitting in, in the sanctuary, are looking up at the person on the bima in a setting like this. You know, I'm seeing everyone's face, and when we do things like this, whether it's uh, an event like this, or even our, our our board meetings at Temple, or you know, the weekly Federation Zoom call, or all my 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 meetings at work that are done this way, there's a you're you're still you're seeing people, maybe a little better. And it's not, it doesn't replace in-person contact by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, I mean, thank God we have this technology. Imagine, imagine if we were going through this 20 years ago and how different it would be. So I, I'm grateful for that. And my That's feeling of out of control was when Rabbi Alex and Joanne ganged up on me and said, we really, really want you to be president. <laughs> that was my feeling of out of control. That's well, all. I have to tell you that... Um... What you've just said, I, you know, as you say, the blessing is you can look at, look at the screen and see, uh, see the faces of people and their, read their facial expressions, even if you're making it up. Um, but there was a lot of assent there that I saw. And the other thing is, shameless uh, plug here, that one of the themes of my book is that those of us who uh, find ourselves often on the bima looking out at the congregation are in a way sitting in the catbird seat in, in the best seat in the house because what we can see we can see the uh the authenticity of the relationships of the people in front of us we can see the affection we can see the peak if there's peak we can see people looking at their shoes to see it you know how their shoes look you know but we but you see hands reaching for hands and you see um you see uh, nasty, quieting looks to children and and cuddling, and it, it's um, it's really not unlike this uh, sharing this Zoom screen and being able to observe um, uh, everyone, particularly Daniel, who seems to be in the forest right now, but moments ago was in uh, paradise, I believe, with palm trees. Oh, and there it, he's on the moon. Pretty good. Alex, go. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but in the middle of our call, my seven-year-old and 10-year-old came in to say goodnight. That's not something that could happen if we had done an event um, 
at the synagogue, uh, nor could my daughter have heard me without her disrupting her whole entire night. Uh, yeah. So, um, it's a real blessing. Our kids are doing great and our family's doing great. And, uh, you know, that we, we, we have had a lot more time uh, as uh, noisy as our house can be, especially <laughs> with the dog too. And maybe another dog on the way. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> we're hoping to get another puppy. Dog alert. You bet. I hope you're glad the kids are in bed now because if they heard that, you'd be, you know. Oh, no, they, I already promised. I promised. Oh, okay. It's a done <laughs> deal. We're, looking. we're past the point where it's easy I to get. I see. It's a done deal. Uh, but uh, Cantor, feel free to call me Alex. It's okay. Uh, we're, no, we're, all, we're all friends here. So okay. Uh, uh, really enjoying your work. It's a really special privilege. Thank you. I, Ganilla, I think you should take this over because basically I have exhausted all of my skills. They are totally played out and I have absolutely nothing left. No, not even one song? <laughs> A song? Yeah, I mean, hello. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> to hallelujah. A request. Something. A request. Oh. Wait, okay, so let me have a sip of water. That is allowed. <clears throat> but only if everybody joins me, muted or not, um, you have to sing with me. Um, even though it's, it's a weird thing about Zoom is we really cannot make music together and it's something that Ganilla and I have noticed in our guitar lessons. <laughs> Making music to get alone, yes, together doesn't work. And uh, Connie, you didn't fix that before you left the IT world. Barbara, I promise to stay muted while you sing. I'll sing along, but I'm going to stay muted. Mindy, you know, you come very close to, to the actual pitch that... Um, uh, which pitch would that be? A, a, any of them. <laughs> any pitch, yeah. I, I'm muted. I'm going back to mute. This was wonderful. We have some... We do have some really actual good singers here, Mindy. I see Bert. I know, I know. And some other people. And by the way, it's great to see the Green Spons all the way in North Carolina. It's yes, it's, there are lots of people from, from uh, different eras of, uh, of your congregations, uh, well, different yes. iterations of your congregation. Um, I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do ya? Well, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you so much. I'm sure that's not how you expected to end this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That meant a lot. Thank you. It meant a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful voice. Uh, sure is. Appreciated over the years in various ways. And thank you for your wonderful book. Uh, it, it tells a story of women that I think a lot of us can relate to. Uh, and it doesn't spare the reader some of the uglier moments either. Which it has a, that honesty and authenticity that Rabbi talked about authenticity, and that is a very big part of writing is that uh, voice that comes through uh, that you have to trust. You know. You know. Uh, well, there's a lot more. I just don't know. I am very work. happy that we had this get together. Perry, did you want to say anything? In Oh, I'm, I'm good. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, everyone. I hope we can do this again soon. Yes, well, let's talk about it. And be safe. Yes. And honey, are you still there, Gianna? I'm here. All right, honey. I love you very much. Love you, too. Okay. Great to see you, Gianna. <laughs> you, too. Thank you. Oh, be safe, everyone. Anyone just wanted to say anything before we say good night? I'm sorry? Did anybody else want to oh. say anything? And the camera beam.
Um, I realized I had one more poem I forgot to read. Would you like me? It's a good ending, Rabbi. Go ahead. Oh, right. uh, I don't want to take away. I'm so glad that, that uh, Barbara read, sang that because my son, my seven-year-old, has fallen in love with that song. He's teaching himself piano, and he's been doing that on his own, no lessons. Uh, so I'll send you a video of it. I meant to do this. This is dedicated um, to a very uh, dear person um, who uh, died um, uh, about eight, eight years ago. Um, and uh, um, if you know Marlene Schilling, Schillinger, her son, Matthew, uh, I was witness to his very final moments and it was, he, we were fighting for his life and a tear ran down his face. Uh, and so this was the poem I read at his funeral. It's called A Tear for Matthew. A perfect round tear Roll down your perfect round face. We watch the tear glide like a Michael Jackson moonwalk or a Barbara Streisand aria. The clear droplet of energy appeared purposeful, hopeful. There was no time to reach for tissue. We, like you, remained frozen. The machines beeped behind you and the yellow glow of the hospital lights sparkled with joy. But none of that mattered. We look back up to your eye, trying our best not to break the moment. Your life rolling past us, gliding smoothly, freely, without pause. Perfect ending. Or a beginning. Yeah. Uh, because we all have to carry on. Uh, we have all lost somebody and we know the next step happens. So let's talk about possibly doing a few more of these during the summer. Uh, if you know of anybody who would like to read or be featured, uh, let me know because we filled the slots for the fall, but we didn't think about June, July and August. Cool. So we'll, we'll figure it out. And I'm, I'm so grateful to our featured readers, to everybody else, to Andre, to Barbara's friends, uh, Karen Weber, uh, who read, and Connie Mayer, who spoke, uh, whom I don't know, but I really appreciated it. Um, Thank you, everyone. Bye, bye. Have a greatest night. Good Enjoy. night. Thank you, everyone. It was outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ganilla. Thank you. Thank you, Ganilla. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Cantor. Thank you, Rabbi. And Daniel, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Daniel.